Hi, everyone. I hope the food was good and uh, our break was uh, a good thing to to get uh, oh, strength, strength on again for the rest of the afternoon. So we begin with a, a book presentation. Um, so I think Saha is uh, connected virtually. Uh, but we have um, Professor Grazia Scopio, which uh, is with us today. And so the book is called The Power of Diversity in the Armed Force, International Perspective on Immigrant Participation in the Military. So please enjoy. Bonjour à tous. Good morning. Good afternoon, Actually, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Grazia Scopio, Professor of Defense Studies at the Royal Military College of Canada, cross-appointed here at uh, Queen's the Department of Political Studies, and also a fellow at the CIDP. So thank you for organizing this, Joanna, and thank you for uh, the CIDP team's support. Um, so our presentation today is about a book that uh, Joanna just mentioned, published in August 2022 and uh, co-edited by myself and Dr. Sarah Greco, who's joining us virtually. So I'm gonna let Sarah introduce herself. Thanks, Grace, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for the introduction. As Grace mentioned, I'm Sarah Greco. Currently, I'm serving as the Acting Gender Advisor for Chief Military Personnel within D&D CAF, and I am also a research fellow with the CIDP. I would like to note at the outset that the edited volume is an academic product and thus contains facts and opinions which do not reflect the policy or opinion of the Government of Canada or D&D CAF, so any views that were expressed or that I expressed are my own. Thanks, Grace, over to you. Just a quick overview of our presentation today. Um, we'll start with what was the first step in the project and how did the idea for the book came about? Uh, and then I'll talk about the overall project of which the book is clearly one main output uh, and we'll provide a more detailed overview of the book um, of which I have a copy and some flyers. And for our virtual attendees of the conference, I'm happy to send you the uh, flyer as well uh, via email. Uh, and then we'll have some concluding thoughts. Uh, Sarah and I will do our best to share the presentation. Uh, so um, we'll start with the first step. So the project started with a small panel that I organized for the 2019 Conference of the Inter-University Seminar on the Armed Forces and Society. And that was held in Reston, Virginia in the US. And the panel was entitled International Perspectives on Immigrants' Participation in the Military, Opportunities and Challenges. The panel including presentations from colleagues of mine from the IUS, scholars from five different countries, Canada, Belgium, Australia, United States, and Sweden. And a colleague from the US Air Force Academy, Dr. Ryan Kelty, was our discussant. So that was the first step. How did the idea of the book came about? It was at that very conference in the 2019 IUS conference that the idea of the edited book came about. Through networking, more authors were recruited, so to speak, to, con to sort of contribute to the book further perspectives from seven additional countries, Brazil, India, Israel, the Netherlands, Norway, Poland, and Switzerland. Sarah will now talk a little bit more about the overall project. Thanks, Grace. So what we'd like to start out with is the puzzle that really propelled the work moving forward. So from the literature, there's a clear indication that diversity within the armed forces is a particularly prevalent subject and is very widely researched but it continues to omit, particularly in the Canadian context, a considerable portion of the population, and that is immigrants or non-citizens. So in addition to that puzzle, there is also the concern that discussions within the diversity and inclusion space often focused on either the operational effectiveness argument or the human rights argument. So we tried to blend these together through the argument that the edited volume advances more broadly. 
So an armed forces that really meets the effective strength and um, is also diverse and inclusive was an important springboard for the edited volume. So in the text, we offer an innovative argument for how to increase, di increase and diversify the armed forces while at once also bolstering recruitment. And that is through the acceptance and integration of immigrants into the armed forces. So the volumes grounding claim is really that the participation and integration of immigrants or non-citizens in the armed forces is a strategic and operational imperative, as well as an ethical, ethical and moral obligation. So we saw this volume really as a way to bridge the gap between academic and practitioner communities, particularly those studying in the space of military culture. As well, we hoped that this volume would encourage policymakers, particularly in the Canadian context, but also around the world, to really think and reconsider the way that the armed forces can include or should include a larger proportion of the populations within those respective nations. And then we also really aimed to have this be accessible to the general public, hopefully to also help continue the dialogue within that particular space. In the context of the relevance to D&D CAF, we can point to Strong, Secure, Engaged, Canada's 2017 defense policy, the diversity strategy, particularly within CMP, employment equity goals that exist within D&D CAF, and more recently, reconstitution efforts. So in terms of the project outputs, as is displayed on the screen, there were really three main outputs for the project. So first, there was a virtual workshop that we held through the CIDP on 25 and 26 of June 2021. And then following from that and following from the insights that we gleaned from that workshop, we were able to publish a policy brief also with the CIDP in the October timeframe. And then finally, as Grace mentioned, this past August, we were able to finally see the publication of this edited volume. We were really grateful to be able to, in this entire process, really harness the international perspectives that Grace mentioned from a, a really diverse group of individuals. So this included experts and government officials and military personnel, as well as other stakeholders. And we were really happy to see the project be interdisciplinary, truly interdisciplinary in nature with contributors from different sectors, including sociology, psychology, and political science. And we were really pleased to see that the project in total involves a number of seasoned academics, but also early career researchers and students. Part of the project was conducted during Dr. Scopio's time as a Fulbright Scholar at Norwich University in Vermont, Vermont, where she served as the Visiting Research Chair in Peace and War Studies. And we're forever grateful to the support of the CIDP because it was amazing. We would not have been able to do this without them. Speaking of, uh, so in terms of project funding agencies, we were really grateful to a number of different stakeholders who allowed us the opportunity to pursue this research forward. So that included SHRC with a Research Connection Grant, D&D through a Minds Targeted Engagement Grant, RMC in the form of a research bursary, and Queen's University through the CIDP and through the Faculty of Arts and Sciences and the Department of Political Studies. We also received support from the CDSN to help with this uh, help with this initiative. As Grace mentioned at the outset, the edited volume was published with McGill Queens University Press as part of a special series. So this was the, or is rather, the Human Dimensions in Foreign Policy, Military Studies, and Security Studies edited volume, which is edited in total by Drs. Stephanie Belanger. Pierre Jolico and Stephanie von Latke. This particular series focuses on unpacking the current and prospective security challenges from that human perspective and seeks to bring in broad readership for both academics and the general public alike. This provides, this slide provides basically an overview of what, uh, what the book came to be. So Grace and myself co-edited the volume. We were lucky to have 
Acting CMP Major General Lise Bourgon write the foreword and she was also involved in the workshop as one of our keynote speakers so we were grateful to have her. Grace and I co-edited an introductory chapter and then as she mentioned we had a variety of different individuals contribute to the contents of the book through various other chapters with Dr. Al Okros concluding with that uh, with the chapter that he wrote. Um, and as I mentioned as well, there was a, a diverse array of individuals with different backgrounds academically, um, professionally, and in terms of their, um, their stages in their career. So we were really grateful to be able to harness all of that and also have a number of different methodological approaches. So from that perspective, there was also diversity within the book, noting uh, an ability to leverage both qualitative and qual qualitative and quantitative and mixed methodologies within the entire edited volume. Thank you, Sarah. I will just give you a little overview of each of the chapters, uh, including also the foreword by Major General Lise Bourgon. In her foreword, the, majors, the, the Major General Bourgon states that diversity is essential for the security environment. There's a concrete strength in diversity. It contributes to greater operational effectiveness and institutional success. However, the key to diversity is inclusion, because inclusion unlocks the power of diversity. Equity does not automatically translate in inclusivity. When it comes to immigrants and non-citizens, equity remains a very important consideration. The institution must change to allow equitable access. And once it does, through targeted recruiting and other initiatives, immigrants and non-citizens will be able to enter into the forces along with all other eligible individuals and be able to thrive and contribute to the organization. General Bourgon concludes by saying, it is my hope that this is just the beginning of discussions to achieve a more equitable, diverse and inclusive military, not as a dream for the future, but as a reality for tomorrow. In the first chapter, Resten focuses on Belgium and the impact on migration waves on military recruitment and retention, particularly within the European Union. Since 2003, citizens from other EU countries can apply to the Belgian Defence Force. This greater openness, however, has had limited success based on low numbers of non-nationals in its ranks. One of the major obstacles that prevents non-citizens from entering the Belgian military is the current language requirement and having to work in a bilingual French-Dutch environment. In particular, officers have to be bilingual by law. This chapter raises the question of whether Belgium might need to consider recruiting non-EU immigrants to fill its military ranks. To answer this question, the author analyzes current policies and legal evolutions, as well as the results of our quantitative study, looking at the perception and acceptance of ethnic diversity among military personnel. The chapter on Switzerland by De Rosa and Tresch compares attitudes and perceptions of individuals with and without migration backgrounds towards the Swiss armed forces. High rates of migration have made Switzerland a more multicultural society, which has been reflected in its armed forces, particularly due to general conscription for all Swiss men. The authors present the results of their research where they surveyed nearly 1,300 Swiss recruits to quantify the impact of conscription on recruits with immigrant background. What they found is that after completing basic training, recruits with migration backgrounds show a slightly higher motivation and willingness to perform in the armed forces. They consider military service more profitable for their own personal development than their peers without a migration background. They believe that a militia cadre position within the armed forces enjoys a high social reputation. And finally, they feel more Swiss than before their service and more integrated into Swiss society. In the chapter on the Australian Defence Force, Pendlebury explains why ADF remains predominantly Anglo-Celtic, despite efforts from the Australian government to build a military that reflects the Australian demographics. Existing initiatives aimed at diversifying the ADF have emphasized capability benefits to an organization that is culturally and linguistically diverse. 
This is a similar argument to that presented in support of increasing the number of women in the military. In other words, first and second generation immigrants are also othered to argue for their inclusion in the military. The author argues that unlike women, methods of classifying and recording this otherness are fraught, and senior leaders are faced with a difficult task on developing policy based on incomplete and misleading data. The author outlined some of the challenges facing decision makers in understanding the levels of diversity within an organization, and he suggests that such efforts can distract from a broader liberal democratic goal of removing barriers to service for a broad spectrum of Australians. The chapter on Canada by Scopio, Otis, and Yan discusses opening military service to immigrants and non-citizens as a means of increasing representation of visible minorities and at the same time addressing recruiting challenges in the Canadian Armed Forces, while at the same time prov providing some newcomers a possible path towards citizenship, integration, and a Canadian identity. Gentile's 1996 diversity framework provides an analytical tool to analyze and understand CAF responses with respect to diversity and inclusion. The chapter also presents select studies that examine perception and attractiveness of the CAF as an employer and barriers to joining across different groups. Finally, using data from a survey completed by CAF applicants at the end of the recruiting cycle, the chapter examines differences in the factors that influence Canadian-born and foreign-born applicants to join and in their satisfaction with CAF recruiting. The chapter on Israel by Shalom, Babis, Sabar, Frenlar, and Berger addresses experiences of second-generation foreign migrants in the Israel Defense Force, or IDF. Children of working migrants in Israel are granted citizenship, and therefore, they must enlist in military service. The authors investigated the adaptation of these children of migrant workers who serve in Israel's compulsory service to assess their satisfaction with military service, willingness to excel, and perception of cohesion in the, as the multicultural climate of the unit. These attitudes were then compared to a sample of soldiers who immigrated from the former Soviet Union two decades ago. And the results indicate that soldiers who are children of migrant workers are highly adapted to the military, although they seem restricted to certain roles and are seldom appointed to higher ranks. Archer looks at non-citizen military participation in the US military. Beginning with its global war on terror, the US Armed Forces and its partners displayed that they understood the value of diverse teams working together for strategic purposes. The US DOD made efforts to draw on diversity through the recruitment of immigrants. However, recent changes to policies threatened the diversity of its armed forces as immigrant enlistees have been discharged and recruitment programs for immigrants were suspended. Archer uses this recent case study to explain the importance of diversity in the armed forces, highlighting immigrants as force multipliers within the military. She offers a theoretical argument whereby the three categories of immigrant, gender, generational status, and citizenship status work in synergy to produce a soldier with unique skills and perspectives, which creates a more effective fighting force and strengthens readiness. The chapter by Holmberg and Pav explores how the military in Sweden maneuvers in between traditional citizen soldier values and progressive politically driven ideas of diversity and equality. They focus on 2015-2019 period when conscription was reintroduced in Sweden in response to military recruitment shortfalls and a perceived decrease in national security. Concurrently, Swedish society was confronted with increasing migration flows, which at once brought challenges to the welfare system and strengthened sentiments of nationalism. The authors conducted a qualitative study to find out how the military manages traditional and progressive ideas of rights and responsibilities of citizens and people residing in the country in a context where these values are highly politicized. In their chapter, Mulker and Salah present results of their study showing that younger generations from immigrant backgrounds in the Netherlands are interested in military careers, but they're not aware of the possibilities. 
In their study, the authors interviewed youth from mostly Moroccan ethnic backgrounds at a martial arts school in the poor parts of large cities like The Hague, where the Dutch Armed Forces was also recruiting. The results showed that the youngsters were very interested in joining the military, but they were not aware of the possibilities to pursue a military career and that there were some gender differences also in their findings. In her chapter, Dara Hugo presents her research on the perception of military service within Brazil. Her research shows that being young in a multicultural society does not guarantee a young and multicultural armed force. As she points out, Brazil's past military dictatorship with its strict nationalistic policy was a huge setback for Brazil to diversify its armed forces. The author provides a historical overview from the post-independence period to the military dictatorship when the armed forces defended the nations and its interests and became one of the main actors in Brazilian politics and the guardian of nationality. The author concludes that the fact that only native-born Brazilians can become officers, resulting in a predominantly white military elite, is an indication that nationality and nationalism walk hand-in-hand in, hand in the Brazilian armed forces, supporting the belief that naturalized Brazilians cannot be fully trusted to defend their homeland. Chapter 10 compares policies in India, Norway, Poland, and Poland regarding immigrant participation in the armed forces. In India, the criteria to get recruited in the aspect of citizenship is based on being either a citizen of India or a migrant from Nepal, Bhutan, Tibet, or Pakistan, Thailand, and Vietnam. In Poland, the recruitment of foreigners or immigrants in the armed forces is not allowed at all. In Norway, foreign citizens are not allowed in the armed forces except for individuals from Iceland due to a contract between the two countries. Authors identify the legal, political, and societal factors that impact whether a country allows non-citizen military participation or not. The authors also outline some underlying reasons why immigrants would seek out opportunities to serve in militaries outside of their native homeland, including the opportunity to gain legal status of citizenship. The Authors also discuss some of the perceived challenges faced when the immigrants in the military are placed in position of power, namely when foreigners are in the position of power. The last chapter, our concluding chapter by Dr. Alan Okers, where he provides a summary of the volume's main takeaways, outline some of the key points of convergence and divergence across the chapters. The areas of convergence include the rationale for why the topic of immigrants and the military is important, the conditions under which individuals are deemed to be of value to the military enterprise, and perspectives on the challenges of managing diversity within defense organizations. Okers also outlined some of the new questions and avenues for future research that this volume prompts. He also presents some new theoretical frameworks that may illuminate the topic under consideration, the observations and suggestions in this chapters are offered to assist scholars to situate these types of studies in broader frameworks, to apply more critical perspectives, and to engage in theory building. The issues being examined are significant to the academic and professional military audiences, but more importantly, they're crucial for the individuals who are the focal point of these chapters, those seeking to serve the nation in uniform. Some final thoughts on our book project and also just a little preview of a follow-up project that just started. So to conclude, to augment recruiting pools and increase diversity, the discourse around immigrant and non-citizen the military must shift from how to manage diversity and specifically other minority groups to how to provide diverse group equitable access and an inclusive work environment in line with a broader approach of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Now, a few words about the follow-up project started in spring 2021 um, with myself and Dr. Amy Vieira from Norwich University, entitled Stories of Immigrant Soldiers, Experience of Immigrants in the Military from an International Perspective. It's a qualitative study using narrative inquiry to gather the stories and lived experience of immigrant soldiers, aviators, and sailors serving or having recently served in the militaries of the five I countries, Canada, the US, Australia, the UK, and New Zealand. 
I'm happy to talk to you about it after um, or during the question period. I can give you more details. I'm going to pass the last final words to Sarah. Awesome. Thanks, Grace. Just wanted to underscore some of what was mentioned at the beginning portion of this presentation in terms of the background and the impetus to the project and how it started with a smaller panel at IUS and just highlight it as a as it was a really great opportunity from um, an early career researcher perspective in terms of how there are positive impacts that go along with attending conferences, engaging workshops, and being able to sit on panels. So those ideas and connections can help you facilitate other projects, professional development, and things of the like. And would just like to close with saying a big thank you on behalf of Grace and myself for the opportunity to present on our edited volume. As Grace mentioned, there are some book flyers and I can pop into the chat a link to uh, some of the websites if you are interested in taking a look at the book. And we would invite you to ask any questions and, and we would be happy to field them. Thanks. Is there any question? Yes. Hi, um, I'm Margaret of Biomich. I'm an officer cadet at the Royal Military College. Um, and for, for me, I'm going to be an, an intelligence officer. And so as an immigrant myself, I really appreciate the diversity in the armed forces, but um, given the new policy with the CAF about letting um, permanent residents um, join as well. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts are on the security implications of that. Um, because I know, you know with having a, another country's passport, it makes it more difficult to get a security clearance. So I was just wondering how you think um, the, the CAF can ma manage that balance of being equitable, but also being secure. Thank you. Great question. So indeed, since the publication of the book, uh, the Canadian Armed Forces have now opened up recruitment to permanent residents that happened in November 2022. So just, just now, uh, a month ago. And uh, that's something I've been advocating for a long time. The security clearance is a challenge, even for Canadian born, let alone if you were born outside the country, let alone if you are, are not a citizen yet. And so by definition, you've only arrived just a few months prior potentially, and then you decide to apply. So currently the process is too long. It's extremely long. Uh, and so that will impact on the ability of the Canadian Armed Forces to actually finalize the recruiting process. So while this process takes, it could take a few months, say for a Canadian born applicant, it might take over a year for a foreign born and it might take longer for a non-citizen. So the, the solution, in, there's not one simple solution to this, but they really need to look at how to, A, on the one hand, expedite the process and potentially just maybe have a, a very basic enhanced security to attend, say, basic training while they do a longer process. So they could look at different countries and how they're doing it. The Americans have been recruiting the citizenship is not a requirement to join in the US Armed Forces. So there's other countries who've been doing it for years and decades even. So look at how they're doing it and maybe get some lessons from that experience. But ultimately the, the process is too long and needs to be expedited. Other questions? Yes. It looks like there's a question in the Q&A box online from John St. Denis. I don't know if you'd like me to read it. Um, yes. Okay, it reads, was the Canadian Armed Forces trial with recruiting permanent residents in the early 2000s explored for lessons learned? And John, I'm not sure if that refers to the actual edited volume or whether that refers to what D&D CAF has done to leverage that information. So I, 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 I am, I'm not aware of a lesson learned report stemming from this trial that our um, audience's members referring to. 
Uh, I would love to see a lesson learned report on that. And uh, perhaps that could in inform the way ahead. So I, I, I'm not sure how ready uh, the, uh, the, the recruiting offices um, are to, you know, potentially to, to not potentially to open the doors to permanent residents. And for sure, uh, if there are any lessons to learn uh, or best practices to, to draw from from other countries, I think they should be aware of that. There was a, a question from Stephanie. Thank you and congratulations again on, on the book. My question is about the US model and I'm wondering if the co-editors and co-authors of the intro want to tell us how, what you think of, of that model for Canada. Is the US model applicable? And if so, what would it take in Canada to implement that? Understanding that we just had this recent change in November with, with the permanent residents, should we think more ambitiously and look towards the U.S. model? Should we wait and see how this first uh, change is being implemented and how successful that is? So I know I'm being lazy here because I could just refer to the book that I have at home and <laughs> take a look at your chapter, but I'll ask you directly since you're both here. So when you're saying the, uh, thank you for your question, Stephanie, and uh, um, so what you're saying is in the US, if you join as a citizen, you your your process for, for citizenship is expedited. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Yes. So I don't think Canada is ready for that. That's my short answer to that. And the long answer is that yes, they should look at, at doing that as a second step. I just don't know how ready they are because it does involve more than one department. And I don't know if those conversations, um, you know, how far they've gone in those conversations, because it does imply different, uh, so the, the obviously citizenship um, the, um, department, the DMD, uh, potentially other departments as well. So it would have to be more like a whole government approach to address uh, something like that. So I think that for now, uh, it, this is a good first step to just open the recruiting. And it, it, it was on the website right away, which I was very impressed with. So you can go on the recruiting website and all, before November 1st, it said you needed to be a Canadian citizen. Now it says Canadian citizen or permanent resident. So it's a great first step for Canada. I don't know why they didn't advertise it more, to be honest with you. So I think attraction and recruitment need to be sort of um, leveraged a little bit more uh, see how this first phase goes, and in the in the meanwhile, start looking at expediting the citizenship process because that will be a huge attraction for newcomers for sure. Thank you for your question. Another question, Marshall? Yeah. Please. So, education and training within the Canadian Armed Forces is fairly homogenous. There's one type of student and everything really gears towards them. Within the book, do you know if it speaks to educating a more diverse population? So permanent residents will be a wide range of backgrounds, cultures, et cetera. And do any of the chapters delve into the issues associated with expanding training or education to account for that? That's going to be your next project. <laughs> Uh, we're we're really looking more at participation in the book, but I'm going to let Sarah jump in uh, because she might have a different perspective on that. Uh, I, I think that's a great sort of avenue to pursue in terms of how ready is the Canadian military for uh, permanent residents to join from. As we know, the great majority of our permanent residents are right now from India. An immigrants, I should say, uh, based on our latest uh, statistics, Canada, India, China, and I want to say the Philippines, and not necessarily in that order, the Philippines might be second right now. So at the end of the day, we're talking about a very, very multicultural potential group of applicants who are going to come in with different education potential um, backgrounds that we need to A, recognize. So there's that f first step, right? They might already have credentials, they might already have experience, so we need to recognize that. And then there's the whole other part of the cultural piece and, you know, broadening our education and training to account for that inclusivity. I'm going to let Sarah jump in. 
Absolutely. Thank you. I think that that's an excellent question. And I think it pertains not just to immigrants or non-citizens, but also just a more diverse recruitment pool writ large. So as we see reconstitution move forward, as we see increased efforts to recruit, train, and retain a more diverse force, um, particularly along employment equity lines. This is something that will be important from a military professional education and professional development um, vantage point writ large. So there is work being undertaken. For example, Grace and I were recently in Brussels on a Partnership for Peace consortium um, workshop that pertained to women, peace, and security, and how to incorporate WPS principles, equity, diversity, inclusion, and indigeneity principles into curriculum development. So not just in terms of actually how we're teaching or what we're teaching rather, but also how we're teaching. So the pedagogy behind this is also important. So we're cognizant of what is being taught is important to reconsider and reevaluate and understand more panoptically. And also also acknowledge and appreciate that the way that all of us learn may be different. And so we need to make sure that all individuals within the CAF are set up to succeed from a training, professional development, and education perspective. So I appreciate the question, and I think it speaks to the CAF's effort to diversify more broadly, not just within the, the efforts currently undertaken for immigrants or, or permanent residents. Another question? Uh, yes, good afternoon. I'd like to comment on that last comment, if I may. Um, I've been involved with CPCC and some discussions on that because of uh, the population we have at the military college now. For example, the third most spoken language on campus is Korean. Um, but uh, other training establishments have run into problems dealing with um, cu other cultural aspects. So feeding during Ramadan, uh, Borden was unable to feed um, the trainees there because the contract for the civilian cooks didn't allow them to come in to prepare the meals at that time of day. So there's myriad things that we have to look at aside from integrating aspects into teaching. Um, I remember once I did a tour of the campus of uh, RMC to our alloy students, their indigenous students. Uh, and here I was with my colonial narrative ready to go. And I thought, uh oh, I've got to change the narrative completely and integrate that aspect. So that's happening. But uh, spaces for worship and reflection, uh, acknowledgement of certain holidays, there's myriad things that have to occur as well. So um, it's, it's a big package when we're also wrestling with other aspects of cultural change. And I'm hoping we're going to see progress, but let's wait and see. Thank you. Great comment, Annie. I think that um, this can be part of the cultural change. So I, I think that there's strength in numbers. And when we're still counting, um, you know, people of color, onesies and twosies, or in higher leadership uh, tables, we're counting women as onesies and twosies. But once the, the, these numbers increase, right, then we have no choice. So as we're opening the doors, we also need to make this culture change happen. And include that this whole piece that you just described needs to be part of the culture change. So I think it's great. What you all these comments you made are bang on. Sarah, did you want to add anything? I would I would reinforce the the comment and and say thank you because I, I think it illustrates that there are a lot of areas where there needs to be change when it comes to uh, D and D calf and um, you know some of which include changes let's say to the dress instruction or having the ability to ensure that all individuals have the religious and spiritual support that they have through chaplain services. And so I acknowledge it goes beyond training to really look at all spaces within the CAF and all spaces that touch all individuals or all members. Um, and, and, you know, acknowledge as well that it is certainly a, a going to be an ongoing process, but that like you've mentioned, there are many different areas that will require changes or or reviews and and perhaps you know the undertaking of gba plus and leveraging those tools that we already have within our toolbox may help us to ensure that we're doing our due diligence in advance and and not doing any additional harm and i would uh yeah just thank you for your comment 
Thank you. Uh, I think we came to, the, to, to an end for the question. So once again, thank you to uh, both of her. And we have a quick five minutes break uh, until panel number four.